for the movie titled Back to the Future? Y'all remember that? Remember that? Back to the Future. And so Skip, that opens November 22nd. That's like, you know, some image we pulled from somewhere. But Back to the Future was about this eccentric uh, scientist who created a time-traveling DeLorean, right? Did I pronounce that right? A DeLorean, right? Who looks, a DeLorean, the way in, in the movie, at least, it looks something like that cyber truck that uh, Tesla has, you know? Now that I, you know, kind of think about that and you look at that, that cyber truck there. But anyways, back to the future, they, you know, they go, the, the movie, the series is really about uh, going back to the future and messing things up in the past, and then the movie's about like fixing them, right? And, and getting things straight because they went back in time and they met people and parents and all this sort of thing. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I haven't watched it recently. It's been years. Believe it or not, that movie came out in 1985. Like, wow, I couldn't believe that when I looked that up the other day. I'm like, 1985? Wow, that seems like so long ago, but so, you know, it just seems like yesterday at the same time. But... Uh, you know, Michael J. Fox, known as Marty McFly, travels back in time and he messes things up and the mad scientists and him and his buddies have to fix things that they've messed up now and they got to travel back and get it all right. And my question to you this morning in regards to this, if you could, had the ability to go back in time, would you change anything? Now, we, we would easily shake our heads, right, and say, yes, I would do that. But then there's the potential, right, of messing things up right now. And the reality is, we would all go back and change certain things. And one of the things that I would go back and change, or at least go back in time and deal with, was my fifth grade elementary school teacher. <laughs> Immediately when I thought about it, when I wrote that question down, I'm like, I know what I would do. I would go straighten him out. <laughs> God bless teachers. It's not about that. It's about this mean guy that I had in fifth grade that would literally throw students up against the locker and try to scare them to death, and all sorts of things. And I, I was one of those people he threw up against the locker, and not that I didn't deserve discipline, but he was a mean dude, a mean teacher. He once told one of my classmates, who he embarrassed in front of the whole class, a fifth grader that was crying in class, a male, right? A male young kid. He says, you could water my plants with your tears. Right in front of the whole class. So I'd go back and straighten that out, or straighten him out. Hopefully he has found the Lord and corrected uh, his well-being, right? I'm okay, I got therapy, okay, just so you know, but maybe I could use a little extra prayer on that. But if some, here, here's another serious question. If someone could look back on your life and see what kind of person you were what would they see? You thought I'd go light on Labor Day, didn't you? If someone could look back in time on your life, what would they see and what would they know about you? Hopefully a new creation, right? And I'll be honest with you, I did some pretty stupid and embarrassing things that I don't want anyone to know about right I think I'm not the only one I'm not the only one I don't want anyone to this day knowing about that now I just want to clarify I didn't like break the law and go to prison or something okay I just want to you know I, I you know but we did stupid things I did stupid things at least I could speak to myself I see all your halos out there but you know I don't <laughs> think you're so innocent. And so I, you know, I was blessed 
as a child and as a teenager to grow up in a Christian home. And two of my uncles, one has since went to be with the Lord, were both ministers of the gospel. They were pastors. And they were PK kids. Got two of them right in the front row here. And my one uncle pastored in the Traverse City area, beautiful location right across the uh, East Bay. And I remember that my cousin had this collection of cassettes. Remember cassettes? I think we, we have that on there. Yeah, remember those? I didn't put no you know, album cover on that, right? And my cousin, like, in his room had like, I mean, sometimes you remember things bigger than they really were, but I just remember this ginormous, like he had every cassette and every album, I call it album, but that, and he would, I thought it was so cool when I visited his house. Like he would like, when we would go to bed at night, he'd lay there and he had the, he, you know, he, we know Bluetooth. Now there was no such thing as Bluetooth, but he had these speakers and he'd play this music, right? And, you know, it wasn't probably that good of music, some of it, right? But I just remember, like, man, look at his collection. I want that. And so I asked my dad, Dad, can I get one of those cassettes? And he says, what's the name of the title of the group? And I told him the title of the group, and he says, oh, no, that's devil music. <laughs> and so... I said, okay, I can't get that. He told me I can't buy it. But he didn't tell me I couldn't steal it. And so I'm not gonna go down that path. We have young ears listening this morning. But I got myself a nice collection of cassettes. And that's one of those things that I am not proud of. Something in our past, some embarrassing thing, some stupid stuff that we have done. And I'm sorry, Dad, that you had to find out about that. My dad had no idea about that. But the good news, Dad, is that I'm a preacher now. <laughs> right? I'm a preacher now, Dad. So that's okay. It's okay. Because here's why it's okay. Psalm 103, 11, verse 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions, which means sins, our sins from us. Amen? By the power of his blood on the cross of Calvary, we can go before the Lord and say, Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sins and the way I have offended you. And he paid the price so that we could live the rest of our lives. And, but I still don't want everybody knowing about the stupid stuff I did, right? And in our main text today, a famous story of a Samaritan woman who said this about Jesus, John 4, 39b. Come meet Jesus. He told me everything I ever did. <laughs> wow. Come meet Jesus. He told me everything I ever did. Listen carefully. And maybe the politicians would want to hear this as they pass their rambling laws and agendas, especially those that don't stand for life. You're not getting anything past Jesus Christ from your past. And so often we think, oh, you know, those dirty, rotten scoundrels, and they are, the way they're living. But friends, they're not going to get away with anything. 
when they faced the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it says this in Scripture, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. Everyone who has ever been born and lived on this earth will confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And so dirty, rotten politics, whatever, people, disruptors of faith, people that have done such awful things, you can't even mention them out loud. They're not getting away with anything. And guess what? Neither are we. So I'm not going to exclude myself, but, but the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, right, gives us a new day, a new season, a new opportunity where the old is gone and the new has come. Glory be to God. So you don't have to stand condemned when you, when you go before the Lord. You can hear the words of Jesus say, well done. Good and faithful servant. Now in this story of the Samaritan woman at the well, you've probably heard it if you've been around Christianity for some time. I want to give you a little bit of background about the Samaritan and Jewish relationship. And I didn't put this in the notes, but think about the tension between the Palestinians and Jews right now and the hatred, this is what it was like. This is what it was like. But I'm going to read a quote which is in your sermon notes on the application. Um, I'm going to read this quote from multiple theological sources about the Samaritan and Jewish uh, relationship. The relationship, I quote, between Samaritans and Jews was complex and marred by deep-seated animosity that spanned centuries, rooted in differences over religious beliefs, practices, territories, and historical conflicts. The Jews cursed them and believed them to be accursed. Now listen to this. Their most merciful wish, that is the Jews, was that the Samaritans would be annihilated and that they would never experience the resurrection. That was their wish. And so the tension was there. And we're going to see Jesus Christ meet a Samaritan, and a Samaritan woman, woman for that matter, because women were considered, in many instances, secondhand citizens, and they weren't well respected. We're going to pick it up in John chapter 4. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 4, verses 1 through 14 to start. We're going to read a long section of of Scripture. And we're going to take some pauses in between. But uh, John chapter 4, 1 through 14. And it says this, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although... In fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back and went once more back to Galilee. And so there's this jealous, you know, thing that, you know, they're, they're jealous of Jesus and uh, they're pointing fingers at him. And, you know, some of the things that we have talked about. And so it says this. Now he had to go. That's Jesus had to go through Samaria. Verse 5 says, So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Uh, Jacob's well was there. Now in your application, uh, I give great detail about Jacob's well. I'm not going to go into detail here this morning, but take a look at that. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, listen to this, tired as he was from his journey. Yes, Jesus took on flesh like you and I, and he was tired. And he needed a rest, 
and he needed a drink. And as you know, Jesus, in the Gospels, early in the morning, he would go on a mountainside to pray or get away from his disciples and the crowds, and he'd pray to the Father and say, Lord, give me a God moment today. And here was his God moment. He sat down by the well. It was the sixth hour, which was, which was the time was about noon to 1 p.m., which was, which, you know, women would come draw the water, but they would come earlier in the morning or later at night when it, was, when it was cooler, right? So it was odd that this Samaritan woman was coming out to draw water between noon and 1 p.m. And so she probably was trying to hide from the crowds, more than likely. And we're going to discover some more things about her in just a bit. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food. Verse 9 says, The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There's this tension, right? Like, she couldn't believe it. She was in, you know, she was in shock. Like, this is a Jewish man, and I'm here trying to hide from a crowd, and this guy shows up, and he's asking me for a drink of water. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, who it is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water, which means bubbling spring, alive water. That's how it translates, living water. They would have, when she heard that, living water was understood as a bubbling stream, like an artesian well type of a thing, right? A bubbling water out of the ground. It was, a, it was a live water. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She goes, well, sir, verse 11, this woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can I get this living water? Yeah, right, I... Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and also his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him. Here it is, right? a spring of water, life in that water, flowing water, fresh water, spring of water welling up to what? Eternal life. So he looked into this woman's soul and he said, this water that I offer is more than just Jacob's well. It's Jacob's well-being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she still wasn't comprehending like you and I. Give me some of that water, like, right? If we could just take a sip of that water, like, you know, physically, She's thinking in physical terms and Jesus is thinking in spiritual terms like he always does. Looking inside of our souls, wanting transformation, wanting us to change our heart and mind and attitude, our way of life, our way of thinking. I want to make a very important point to those of us who are Christians. If we could pull this up. Witnessing to people starts with the conversation. And I'll be honest with you, I'm guilty. Sometimes I'm just a hurry. I'm in a hurry a lot. And I don't want to be bothered with this, any sort of conversation. Now you're just all staring at me like, <laughs> like that's never been you. 
Like you're just pumping your gas bubbly and talking to everyone around you, right? Sometimes we just want to hide in a cave, right? Let's be honest. But witnessing to people starts with the conversation. It doesn't have to start with, you know, like all these scriptures like, hey, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and all this different stuff. We don't have to memorize the Bible, okay, to start a conversation with somebody, even people who don't think or believe like we do. Think about that. Well, those dirty, rotten scoundrels, you know, I, uh, I, man. We say that about a lot of people. But have you really had a conversation with that individual? Ask the Lord. You don't have to hit them over the head with the Bible and tell them they're going to hell. That's not a good approach. And that's not what Jesus did. But sometimes we do just want to punch people in the face, right? But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus is our example, so we should follow him. We should have conversations with people. But first of all, it starts with prayer so that we will have spirit-filled words to say to those people. Even people that don't think like we do or believe like we do, they need Jesus Christ. And Samaritans were people that believed in, you know, the truth, but half truth, and they were just mixed up theologically. And Jesus will point this out in just a minute. But Jesus didn't blast this woman with judgment, right? When he could have. He didn't blast this woman with judgment he didn't point out all of her spiritual flaws. He didn't do that at all. He looked past all of her scars and all of her pain, which, friends, she would have much, like all of us, from our past. He looked into her soul, and he recognized that she was thirsty. And I say to us this morning, we're all thirsty. We're all thirsty, and it's only Jesus Christ who can satisfy our soul. It's only Jesus Christ that can satisfy our soul. Let's read further, 15 through 19. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may, uh, when I get thirsty, I might not have to keep, to keep coming to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Now that's interesting. Now we say, and when we look at that, hmm, there was no man with her, so where did Jesus get that? He got that from the Father in heaven. It's that conversation. Like in prayer beforehand, Jesus got this divine knowledge, right? You could call it prophetic, you can call it what you will, that, it, it is all of that. But he says something interesting because he knew he was going to go deeper here. He says, go call your husband and come back. It's good news that the woman told the truth. She says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you had, had no husband, here's the ouch part. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. Ouch. What you have said is quite true. And this woman, <laughs> first, first of all, there's a Jew talking to me, and he's a male. I'm trying to hide in my cave and now he asked me to go get my husband, and now he's telling me everything about my life. And the only thing she could say in response, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on the mountain, but the Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now Jesus gives her a little theological reflection here. You could read about it in your app. I don't have time to break it all down. Verse 21, 
Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come. Hear these words. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers my Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. When we, it's just not all about music, but I want to talk about that just for just one minute here. When we're worshiping the Lord, like we just got done doing, when we come together as corporate worship or when you're at your home worshiping down the road, whatever the case may be, shouldn't we be worshiping with all of our hearts. And it doesn't have to look like your neighbor. I'm not saying that you have to be running up and down the aisle. I'm not saying that you have to shout like I do a lot. I'm not saying that you have to wave your arms or anything like this. But there should be something inside of you that moves your heart. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. When you're worshiping the living God in corporate worship or at your home, and when your heart's not moved and nothing comes out of your mouth, oh boy, I'm stepping on toes now. Because you say to yourself, well, I can't sing. There's something wrong with the heart. I say that with love and compassion because Jesus Christ and worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords should move us. I mean, if a Michigan game moves us, if the Detroit Lions game moves us, I mean, we have no problems as human beings cheering them on or saying, that was a bad call. We voice our complaints, don't we? And we cheer, hooray. But what about the king? I'm st- what about the king? When we step into his presence, listen, you have no problem doing the other, but when we step into the presence of the living God, shouldn't there be something that excites us? And if there's nothing that excites you this morning, I suppose maybe you need some prayer. And I say that with love and compassion. But the king of glory, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, should move you. Even if your lips go something like this. It doesn't matter. Or even if your hands stay down like this. Or you go like this. I know. There was a guy, God bless him, that we worship with. And we went to one of those, you know, churches that don't raise their hands. There's lots around, believe it or not. And that's fine. I'm not saying anything. But like, I just prayed for this dude because he's a great Christian man and still is. But this is as far as he could get his hand every Sunday. And I mean, it was just like that. And I just said, Lord Jesus... And he loves you with all of his heart. But would you, yeah. And I would pray, you know, when I got, I mean, I call it, I call it getting fuller of God's spirit, you know. And, and I said, Lord Jesus, just, just get his hand. And I was tempted. <laughs> I will be honest, like cause sometimes we sat in the back with our children, right? And I was tempted at times to go just get his hand up and put it up, right? But he was worshiping the Lord, with all of his spirit and with all of the truth inside of us. And so I want to challenge you this morning. When we're singing, friends, singing praises, not to this worship team, okay? Not to the drums, not to the mics, not to me, please. 
We're singing to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who, when you walk out of this building, every grass and mountain and sky and star and moon and all the starry hosts that you see created it by the power of his mouth. <laughs> so there's something that should excite us, right? And so Jesus points that out. He says, I need worshipers and my father seeks worshipers that will get a little bit excited. Have you ever been to a black church? I've been privileged to be there. Wow, they know how to do it. And they would say amen after the reading of every sentence and every word I was asked to read there one time. When I was going through my apprenticeship, the pastor told me down in Ferndale, Michigan, we went down to actually Detroit. And they said to me, like, spur of the moment, right? You don't like those moments. Will you read this passage? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Okay, yes, pastor. You know, I'm gonna, yeah, I will. And I went up front, and I, man, I mean, I didn't even crack the first sentence, man. They were, hallelujah, right? They were, praise the Lord. I'm like, wow, these people have spirit and truth. But that's who the Father seeks. Now, I'm not saying they're above us and we're below them, so don't misunderstand me. I'm saying there's something in Christ Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that excite our hearts when we praise, when we worship. And worship isn't all about song. It could be worshiping through the word or just praising him or in prayer. But something, it's a matter of the heart, should move inside of you. And I've probably blown up my note. Sorry there, Brian. The woman said, I know, verse 25, I know that Messiah, also called Christ, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And listen to this. Verse 26, then Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Can you imagine that? A Jewish man meets me at the well when I'm trying to hide in a cave he speaks to me, I'm a Samaritan. We don't do that sort of thing. They hate us. They want us annihilated. They knew their theology. And now, I, now he's saying he's the Messiah, but I really can't deny it because he told me everything about my life. Exactly, thank you. Thank you. Took the words right out of my mouth. But no one asks what do you want, or why are, why are you talking to her? The disciples came back in verse 27. They came back, you know, I, as you can imagine, the disciples, they, they didn't really ask, but they're nudging each other, right? Like, man, did Jesus get some of that bad water in the well? Like he's talking to a woman, and he's talking to a stinky Samaritan, Right? I mean, they're probably thinking this, although the scripture says they're not saying it out loud. But something's going on there. They're like, uh, yeah, not right. But this conversation did way more than we could ever hope or imagine because of Jesus Christ's love. Not only did Jesus Christ transform, superly transform this woman's life that was messed up, right? Like all of her life, it was messed up. Radically transformed. She told her Samaritan town and village what Jesus had done for her. And then let's read this as we move to a close, verse 39 through 42. It says this, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Listen, that started with the conversation. He told me everyth everything I ever did. I couldn't get it past him. I couldn't hide. So when the Samaritans came to him, meaning Jesus, they urged him to stay with them 
and he stayed with this dirty, rotten, scoundrel breed, as when the biblical context, right, as we talked about, for two days. And because of his words, which we know his words were filled with love and compassion and kindness and words of a second chance, more became believers that started with the conversation. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and know that this man is the savior of the world. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. We give Jesus a hand clap. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. It's a remarkable story. And I want to leave you this morning with these spiritual truths. Spiritual applications for supernatural transformation. As witnesses of Jesus Christ start conversations with people who you may not even agree with. Scripture says this in Romans chapter 2 verse 4. It's the kindness of Christ that leads people to repentance. Number two. Stop judging and start loving as Jesus showed us how to do. That doesn't mean we condone or we accept, right? But we gotta love people where they're at, just like Jesus did. Number three, Jesus knows everything you have ever done and offers you forgiveness to everyone who asks. Just gotta ask. Just gotta ask, Jesus, Forgive me of my sins and come into my life to be my Lord and Savior. And Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. It's as simple as that because Jesus did all the work, paid the price. I close with this. If you're thirsty, come to Jesus. He will satisfy your soul. Stand with me in closing prayer. And so I want to say this too. Don't give up. Don't give up on people, family members, acquaintances, friends, and and you say to yourself, man, they are so far gone, right? I mean, they're so far out there. They're so far lost that they are never coming back. I mean, they would have said a lot of things about this particular Samaritan woman, right? Right? But Jesus Christ loved her on the road of life and transformed her life. So never stop praying for those people you're trying to pray into heaven. For Jesus Christ satisfies the soul. Amen? Amen. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful story. And we know the tension even in this world between Palestine and in the world, literally, Lord. Right now, it's a chaotic mess, and yet, Lord, you love every single person on this earth. No matter race, religion, status, whatever, Lord, you love everyone. And Jesus, you want to have a relationship with everyone in this world. No matter who they're affiliated with and no matter who they vote for, Lord, you love them all. But Lord, you love them because you want them to come into your kingdom. And so Lord, we pray for the lost. We pray for our lost loved ones this morning, right now, in the mighty name of Christ. Lost friends, people who have fallen on hard times or are just, Lord, humiliated and, and, and depressed because of their past. Heavenly Father, Lord, you're a God of the future and you erase our past by the power of your blood. And may your gospel, the truth, Jesus, come to hearts and minds today and transform them. Help us, Lord, to be able to start conversations, conversations full of your spirit. May we be people of prayer And look for the opportunity, Lord, when you open the door. Lord, bless our day. Bless our weekend as we go and have a day off, Lord willing, Jesus, tomorrow. Bless our families, bless our homes, and bless our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I will see you next Sunday. Have a fantastic day. Don't forget, if you want to sign up, 
for a, a small group or you want to look at the description, it is out in the foyer. Have a blessed day.